You're listening to Nurse Converse, presented by Nurse.org, a collaborative podcast amplifying diverse nurse voices. Get ready for a dose of inspiration, a sprinkle of education, and a whole lot of community. Well, good morning, Nurse Converse community. Today, I will be having a conversation with no other than Rear Admiral Moon. Let's just get right into it, and I will share with you all who Rear Admiral Moon is. Rear Admiral Moon's career has been marked by opportunity and service, manifested through the constant pursuit of excellence, having earned her Bachelor's of Science degree in nursing from Armstrong State University. Rear Admiral Moon began her nursing career as an emergency room department fellow at the Washington Hospital Center, followed by service in the health insurance industry, leading in several critical capacities. In 2002, Rear Admiral Moon joined the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services as a consultant where she served as a surveyor of nursing homes and intermediate care facilities, earning her commission as a lieutenant in the United States Public Health Service in 2005, Rear Admiral Moon began successfully supported, earning her commission as a lieutenant in the United States Public Health Service in 2005, Rear Admiral Moon successfully supported numerous roles in the Division of Immigration Health Services, now known as the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement Health Service Corps. Transitioning back to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in 2013, Rear Admiral Moon helped to lead the implementation of the Affordable Care Act marketplaces, followed by numerous high-impact leadership positions supporting the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services mission. Appointed as Chief Nurse Officer for the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps in 2023, Rear Admiral Moon has pursued excellence through her vision of the HOPE framework, honor, obligation, purpose, and empowerment. Rear Admiral Moon is a board-certified family nurse practitioner, completing her doctoral degree in nursing practice at the University of Maryland in 2020. Rear Admiral Moon also holds a Master's of Science degree in nursing from Marymount University and a Master of Science degree in public health from Emory University. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rear Admiral Moon. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Absolutely. Well, I just want to get started because people are going to want to know a little bit more about why we are in these uniforms. So I'll just share a little bit about the United States Public Health Service. And throughout the interview, you all may hear us refer to it as PHS or USPHS. Um, so please do know that that is what we're referring to. So the United States Public Health Service is one of the eight uniformed services of the government. We are, our mission is to protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of the nation. So we are stationed all across the United States as well as international locations. And Rear Admiral Moon and myself are both nurses of the United States Public Health Service. And throughout our conversation, she will also be sharing more about her role as the chief nurse officer and what that looks like. But I would like for you to just get started with telling us a little bit about your journey and how you uh, began and your interest of um, nursing and how you pursued that. Well, actually, when I went to school, graduated from high school and went into college, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I enrolled in a liberal arts program at Howard University and kind of fumbled around, wasn't really sure. I didn't have clear direction. My mother's a teacher. I had my favorite auntie as a social worker. So those were my role models. So I thought I would probably pursue either one of those, but I wasn't really sure. Nothing was really fitting for me. So I actually left school after about two years or so and got a job working at Blue Cross Blue Shield, where I met a nurse who was working there as a utilization uh, management nurse. And I found out for the first time, I realized how much nursing can do. Uh, there's really no limit to what we can do. And I, you know, I always thought of nurses as being at the bedside, that sort of thing. I had limited medical experience because I was relatively healthy. But speaking to her and learning about how she, her journey and how she became a utilization review um, nurse inspired me. So almost immediately, I actually got a pink slip from Blue Cross Blue Shield. They they got rid of my position. <laughs> so, um, at that time, I said, well, you know, I guess I better go back to school. So I did and immediately pursued all of the prerequisites for nursing school. 
enrolled in nursing school and never looked back. It, it, it just, it's like a light went on and I just knew that that's what I was supposed to do. Oh, what a remarkable journey. I always find that it's fascinating that some of us come to this profession through meeting someone else and just having a conversation and getting an opportunity to learn the different uh, opportunities within the career. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I also see that you attended Armstrong State University. Is that in Savannah, Georgia? Savannah, Georgia. Oh, interesting. Okay, so did you grow up in Georgia and then relocated to the Maryland area? I am a Georgia peach. My father is Air Force, flight engineer in the Air Force, and he was stationed in Savannah, Georgia, Hunter Air Force Base, and I was born there. So I thought it was interesting that I actually ended up returning there to go to nursing school. It, it seemed like just perfect the way that it worked out. It was meant to be. So yes, Air Force brat and Georgia Peach. Wow. So it sounds like uh, the mission of service is well within your family. Very much so. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so beautiful. All right. And then what I also wanted to uh, discuss today is uh, some of the things that we experience, especially within the nursing profession and uh, just kind of getting through now the COVID pandemic with you being in a leadership role. Can you share a little bit about any experiences you've had with burnout and resiliency? Oh, absolutely. I just like everyone else uh, during COVID, I actually was teaching as a clinical instructor at Bowie State University. And in addition to everything else I do, I just felt the need to give back and try to do what I could to train the next generation of nurses. And so just part-time, a clinical instructor. So I was able to go into the ICUs and to the emergency departments and actually see the impact that COVID was having on not just the public patients, but on our nurses and talking with them and, and experiencing that burnout with them, talking through some of the issues they were having. So yes, I personally experienced burnout as well. Throughout my career, even now, I wear several different hats and some days I I just feel exhausted. So for me, it has to go back to self-care. And I talk about perseverance is what I try to encourage nurses to think about perseverance. And what does that mean? That means making sure that you just keep going forward, keep moving forward, keep taking little steps, set little short goals, long-term goals as well. But it's important to have those short-term goals so that you're realizing some successes along the way. Also focusing on the journey, not the end, just enjoying the steps along the way, Uh, staying positive. Negative takes so much energy. I think that I'm energized by positive. I try to keep positive people around me. I try to maintain my positivity, staying creative and innovative, not always taking, I'm not really one to take a no. (laughs) I kind of go through no and, and try to find a creative way to get to yes, remain patient. And I always try to remember my why. Why am I a nurse? Why am I in uniform? Why am I serving the public? It's something that is just part of who I am. It's part of my DNA. And it, it, it inspires me. It energizes me. Also, I practice gratitude. I practice grace, not just for others, but also for myself. And it's important to also maintain balance. You really just gave us a wealth of knowledge with those tidbits. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, And as we're going through this discussion, one of the other things I wanted to speak with you about is in your experiences, you mentioned about just kind of getting through the no's and remembering what your why is. When you look back over your career, what has been the most intrinsically motivating and why? For me, it's purpose. And I included that in my hope framework is just for me, I'm always I've always sought what God's purpose. I'm a, a woman of faith and I've always sought what is God's purpose for myself. And, um, and it, for me, it's always resonated service, always being of service. Uh, you'll hear me say, it's not about me. It's not about me. And that's comfortable to me. It's about service. It's about, it's to me, it's a privilege to be of service. And can you recall on anything that has been your toughest? Toughest. Toughest moments? Uh, yeah, just, um, I started out as an ED nurse, as, as you mentioned in my bio. And one of the things that was tough for me, especially as a new nurse, was some of the traumatic experiences, things that I witnessed in the emergency department, which I won't go into a lot of detail, but as nurses, we we experience very, very sad. We interact with individuals, patients, our patients, the people that we care for, uh, sometimes at their lowest point in their life, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And so 
it's tragic for them. And it also is traumatic for us as well. And I still recall some of those experiences early on in my career and how they traumatized me, to be honest. I mean, there's, there's no other way to really put it. And not really knowing how to deal with that early in my career. So I can think of several situations, um, again, without going into too much detail, but just traumatic experiences in, in dealing with patients and their families and the sometimes unfortunate negative outcomes that resulted in their disease process. So those types of things I remember, um, those are points where I, I kind of have to reflect back and say, okay, I'm here to serve. Sometimes the outcome is not what you want it to be. It's not always ideal. It's not for, as a nurse, you, of course, you want everyone to recover. You want um, the best outcomes for, for your, your patients and for their families and for our, our communities from a public health perspective. But that's not always the case, unfortunately. So you have to be able to process that and be okay with it and learn from it. All right. Well, thank you so much for mentioning that and sharing those, those details with us. Uh, now I would like to go ahead and speak about your career and current role as the Chief Nurse Officer for the United States Public Health Service. How did you learn about PHS? Well, I was actually um, interested in transferring to the federal government from Blue Cross Blue Shield at the time. I actually worked as an emergency, as you already said in my bio, I worked in the emergency department, and then I actually ended up going full circle moment back to Blue Cross Blue Shield and wanted to uh, work in the federal government. I grew up, my father was active duty Air Force, as I, I mentioned, but when he retired from the Air Force, he went into the government. And so I always had this image that I should work in the government and, and for job security, which is in, in this area, the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, that's not uncommon for people to, to seek federal government employment. So I went to work for HICFA. At the time, it was HICFA, Healthcare Finance Administration, which is now CMS, as a nurse consultant. And I think it might have been the first day or the first week that I was there, I saw someone in uniform, one of my coworkers, and I asked about it because I had never heard of the public health service, never seen it, knew nothing about it. As soon as it was actually a pharmacist, had a conversation with her about the public health service and immediately knew that it was something I wanted to do. The opportunity to, to deploy, to be able to serve underserved populations, to really have impact on public health was something that I wanted to do. At the time, I was actually working on my master's in public health, so I had already established a, a very deep commitment and interest in public health in general. And so to learn about the public health service was just amazing to me. I immediately found out what I needed to do to convert from a civil service employee to public health service. And it took a while, took it actually almost three years to be able to do that. But as soon as I was able to convert, I did it. And haven't looked back. It was the best decision I ever made in my life uh, to be able to serve in uniform, which some of that probably came from the fact that, that I am an Air Force brat. So I admired, you know, seeing the uniform service and then the connection into public health. Just it all made sense to me. Wow. And it's been almost a 20 year career almost. Almost. Wow. And it went quick. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's fascinating. And similar to you, um, there was a nurse that I went to undergrad with at Grambling State, and I saw on her social media platform she was in uniform. So I reached out and uh, received information from her. And it didn't take quite three years. I was just at a little bit over two. <laughs> but now I've, I've learned that the process is, is a lot more quicker. And I'll also give some, um, some time for you to share about that as well. But um, yeah, perfect. That's awesome. All right. And then in your role, can you share what some of your personal and professional um, goals are in your current role as the chief nurse officer? Yeah, uh, I'm sure it sounds cliche, but professionally, I want to have a positive impact. I want to make a difference. I want to build as as the chief nurse officer in the public health service. I want to build a strong foundation for the next CNO. I want to inspire those coming next I want to be an inspiration to, to junior officers and to nurses across the nation and globally. Um, on a personal level, I have this thing about Maslow's hierarchy, which I'm sure nurses are familiar with, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the highest level of that pyramid is self-actualization. So I'm always trying to actualize. I'm trying to be the best version of myself and also walk, walk in my purpose. You mentioned earlier about your framework of hope. 
Can you share with us uh, how that has inspired the work that you're doing and uh, more details about that? Sure. When I was uh, considering applying for this role of CNO, um, it wasn't something that I had aspired to do in my career, honestly. And many roles that I've had in the public health service um, and in the government have been because others observed me and said, hey, have you ever considered this? And I'll say, you know what? I hadn't. I, I just I, I keep I just work and I just try to do the best that I can do. And so several uh, individuals, fellow officers and others asked me, why wouldn't I consider that? And I said, you know what? Maybe I should. And so I started to think if, if I was a chief nurse, what would be my priorities? What are the concerns that are that public health service nurses are having, but not just public health service nurses, civilian nurses, federal nurses globally? What are the concerns that are facing the nursing profession? And so I, all these different issues started coming up, the retention, recruitment, the issues that we're having with our profession, um, challenges, burnout, all these type of things were coming into my mind. And I started to think about how can we or how can I address those issues? And it all formulated into this framework of honor, obligation, purpose and empowerment, honor. How can we honor our nurses? How can we acknowledge the work that they're doing? Obligation. Nursing is, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure you know, that nursing is the number one trusted profession in the United States. So that's an, that gives us an obligation to the public, that trust. We have earned it, but we have to maintain it and we have to value that. What is our purpose as nurses? Our purpose is to serve. Our purpose is to uh, try to achieve those, those best patient outcomes healthcare outcomes. Uh, health promotion is a major function of nursing from my perspective. And then making sure that nurses are empowered, self-governance, making sure that we have a voice, that we're at the table when decisions are made and when policies are, are developed. So I thought about all those things and actually, you know, you think about does the chicken come before the egg or the egg before the chicken? So I guess the hope framework was the chicken, maybe. <laughs> However, I'm trying to make this analogy, but anyway, so I, it all just came together and, and it just kind of, I didn't start thinking of hope, but then I started thinking, you know, they always say that nursing is the heart of, of healthcare, but, but then I began to think about how we're the hope. There are a lot of challenges facing not just the United States and, and our population, but just globally challenges, healthcare challenges. Uh, we kept COVID uh, really highlighted, exposed a lot of issues that we have in our healthcare system. And so I began to realize that nursing really is the hope for our healthcare system. Nursing is the hope of our healthcare system. I completely agree. And I love that. I love the framework. And so knowing what your experience of transitioning over to the federal government, how would you encourage um, a nurse who's listening right now or someone who's in nursing school that may be interested about pursuing a public health service? What advice would you give to them? Well, number one, make sure you do well in school. <laughs> Study, work on that critical thinking. Um, that's one thing uh, as an instructor that I focus on with my students is focus on that critical thinking because that's the bread and butter of nursing from my perspective is the way that we're able to use that nursing process and how we think critically and how we're so resourceful. But as far as uh, a career in the public health service, there are opportunities to apply while you're still in school. We have a junior co-step and senior co-step programs. Certainly look into that and, and apply if, if, it, if you are able to do that, We're depending on where you are in your nursing school advancement. I would say uh, reach out, check out usphs.gov and find out more about the service. One thing that I will stress is that I think that some individuals come into the public health service without realizing that we are a uniform service. We are 24 seven. It's a commitment that you're making. And so that does involve, sometimes you may have to deploy. We don't deploy as much as the other uniform services. We don't, we're not armed. We're not quote unquote military, but we do have an obligation to serve when, when there's natural disasters, um, when there are pandemics such as COVID, hurricanes. I myself deployed to Liberia during the Ebola crisis in Africa. So you will be called to deploy. So I think that that's something that's important to understand. So prior to considering coming into this uniform service, 
think about if that's something you're willing to do. It's not for everyone, um, but it is a requirement. So think about that. Think about your commitment to public health. We, in, in the public health service, we focus on underserved populations. Most of us, we, we were, I don't just serve as, a, as the chief nurse officer. I'm also assigned to the Department of Homeland Security and, and ICE, Immigration Health uh, Service Corps. And I serve an underserved population, those that are in detention. Most of us are in positions where we impact underserved populations. So decide, is that something that you're interested in? Also have a conversation with your family, because as I mentioned, this is a uniform service and it, it's a commitment. There's a little bit more than just a 40 hour job uh, that's involved in being uh, in the public health service. So you just need to take all of those things into consideration. And if you think about all of that, you have the qualifications, you meet the, the criteria, then by all means apply. I do consider us to be a elite group of, of officers, particularly our nurses. We have amazing nurses within the Corps. I just, every day when I'm just learning more and more about what we're doing to impact uh, the public health of this nation, I'm just amazed. So those of you that are up to the challenge, I welcome you to apply. Perfectly stated. You mentioned about serving in those underserved populations and I myself uh, before currently working at Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I was on the reservation living and working with the Native Americans there. So I wholeheartedly have experienced that uh, wonderful opportunity to serve those underserved populations. So uh, definitely anyone interested in applying, please do go to the usphs.gov website and take a look around and see uh, what opportunities may be available for you and your family to take advantage of. All right, well, moving on to um, Mentorship. So you mentioned that there were individuals in your life uh, who kind of spoke into you and said, hey, have you considered this opportunity or have you thought about doing this and that? And I found an article on the American Nurses Association, and it was written by Sharon Kusanza, and she defined mentorship that a mentor assists a less experienced nurse to develop and meet his or her career goals by providing resources learning opportunities and ideas to improve performance, as well as helping to identify strengths and weaknesses and evaluating success and failures. Mentoring is essential for the career development and establishment of new nurses and the transfer of years of wisdom and expertise of mature experienced nurses. So can you share a little bit about what your experience as um, receiving mentorship has been? And I also want to notate that you mentioned you also served as a clinical instructor. So I'm sure there were many of opportunities that where you served as a mentor as well. Can you share about any of those? Sure. Uh, mentorship to me is about providing guidance, the benefit of my experience, helping those coming behind me to avoid pitfalls. Some people don't listen, though. They want to, you know, have their own, just fall right into the hole <laughs> and learn, But which is fine because uh, as long as it's okay to fail, um, make mistakes as long as you learn from them. But it's also about appreciation of lessons learned. For me, um, I have had not formal mentorship along the way. Surprisingly, you would think that I would be able to name specific people that served as my mentors. But honestly, for me, um, it has been my father who has passed away two years ago this month, but he was my mentor throughout my life, not just my father. He was a role model to me. I, Whenever I had some kind of question, I would always speak to him and he would always speak to me, not just as a father, but as a professional, as a military officer, as a very educated individual. And so I always valued his advice. For me, um, mentorship it's ideal. I will say it's ideal if you have an, a personal relationship with a mentor um, and that personal contact. That's the ideal situation. And I certainly have many mentees that, that I have those that sort of relationship with, including mentoring and coaching, because there is a difference, students in the nursing program. But it's also possible to have a mentor that is afar, someone that you just observe from a distance that doesn't even know who you are, but you're watching them and you're learning from their experiences. So don't just limit yourself to thinking that you have to have this formal relationship with someone in order for them to be your mentor. That's not always necessary. You can certainly do it through observational mentorship, I'll call it. Maybe I just made something up. <laughs> 
But it's also important once you have gotten certainly to my level that you serve as a mentor, that you are reaching back. And like I said, sharing my experiences, providing guidance when appropriate. But it's also important for people to learn. And sometimes they they do need to make mistakes and then learn from those mistakes. Perfect. And you mentioned uh, mentorship and the difference of coaching. And for those who don't know, can you share a little bit about what those differences are? Coaching more is um, kind of like I, it does, the lines do get blurred easily. Um, mentorship is more, like I said, sharing your experiences, helping individuals to, to kind of guide their career. Coaching is a little bit more, for lack of a better term, personal, on a more personal level, where you're helping individuals through specific situations, coaching them through, um, still allowing them to make decisions and determine their own path, more similar to a counseling relationship versus the mentorship relationship where you have someone who's more senior and someone who's more junior and you're providing that guidance. So it's kind of a more hierarchical relationship, whereas coaching is a little bit more to me like a counseling relationship. All right. And then getting into leadership, uh, speaking of one of the highest ranking leaders within the United States Public Health Service, I uh, would be remiss if we didn't speak about um, your personal leadership styles. I am a servant leader, number one and foremost. I, as again, I, you'll hear me talk about services. I mentioned earlier, for me, service is a privilege and I take that into my leadership style as well. I follow. I'm not always ahead. Sometimes I follow. And I think that's important. I'm not always the smartest person in the room. I recognize that. Um, but as a leader, it's important to surround yourself with smart people and also to leverage. Everyone has strengths and weaknesses. And so as a leader, it's important to identify what those strengths and weaknesses are and so that you can help that individual grow those strengths, maybe even more importantly, work on those weaknesses. But serve part of being a servant leader is to cultivate those skills in individuals and so that they can be the best that they can be so that they can reach, as I mentioned before, that self-actualization. I'm, I think about that for myself, but I also, also think about that for others, helping them to grow and mature to be the best person that they can be. And that's different for everyone. And success looks different for everyone. Yes, very true. And that really much so goes along um, with the information that I found regarding uh, the definition of leadership. So according for the Center for Creative Leadership, leadership is defined by three outcomes, direction, alignment, and commitment, and is a social process where individuals work together to produce results that they could never achieve alone. And you just alluded to that by saying, you know, being able to identify other individuals' strengths and collaborate with them to reach those common goals. So thank you so much for sharing that and for your leadership. Um, and as a leader, with all the responsibilities that you have, can you share what your practice of self-care looks like and how, uh, what impact it has made on your life? Yes, and I'll be honest, I haven't been the best at self-care throughout my career, uh, throughout my life, until recently, the past several years, I have made a concerted effort to focus on self-care. I can be my worst critic. And I have learned, as I mentioned before, about perseverance and giving grace. I have to give myself grace. And so I've learned I'm working on that. It, it's a, something I have to be, I have to pay attention to it. I have to be intentional about it. And I have to say no. I think it's important to know your limits. Um, I think self-awareness is self-care. Sometimes we don't take the time to really reflect on, on ourselves and understand who we are. Why do we react to things a certain way? And that takes self-reflection and it takes time to do that. And you, you have to be sensitive to yourself. And so that's how you're able to know what your limits are. And sometimes you have to say no. And for me, I'm someone, as, as I mentioned before, I'm someone who, who is motivated to serve. I have to say no sometimes, which is difficult for me, but, but I'm getting better at it. As far as self-care is concerned, I enjoy my family, my friends, and my hobbies. And also as a leader, it's important to model self-care. That's one thing that I realized uh, several years ago as a leader Folks are watching me. And so if I'm not practicing self-care, they're not going to practice self-care because they're modeling themselves after me as their leader. And so I realized that and I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm doing a disservice to people if I'm not taking care of myself. So it's important to model self-care with those that I lead 
I try to create a safe environment for them to be authentic and for them to grow as well. And that's the part of the way that I'm supportive in them in uh, pursuing their own self-care. That is powerful. And as you mentioned, just being a leader is so important to be able to practice self-care, identify within ourselves what that looks like, but then also creating that environment where we're allowing safe spaces for individuals to do that as well. Uh, and you mentioned that. Uh, and I think that's just very powerful that as a leader, you are doing that. So thank you for doing that. So we have come to a the end of our discussion today. So thank you so much for your time, Grandma Moon. Before thank you. we end, can you share uh, what your, if you have a call to action, can you share what that would be to the nursing profession? My call to action would be in line with my framework and specifically for the nurses, it is hope, honor, obligation, purpose, and empowerment. Well, you all heard it here, hope. Thank you all so much. And just as a quick overview of some of the things we discussed today, we were able to discuss your career journey uh, from starting as a emergency room or emergency department fellow to now being the chief nurse officer for the United States Public Health Service. We discussed burnout and resiliency, as well as the importance of self-care and creating safe spaces as a leader for individuals who look up to us to be able to practice that as well. In addition, the importance of mentorship versus coaching and what that looks like, leadership, and then lessons learned along the way. So once again, thank you so much for your time this morning. And thank you all for listening. Please do be sure to share this podcast uh, with individuals that, with other individuals, as well as leave a review and let us know how you enjoyed it. So thank you all so much. Be well and practice self-care. Thanks for joining Nurse Converse, brought to you by Nurse.org. Help us grow by leaving a five-star rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Nurse.org supports nurses with career and education tips, life advice, and breaking news. Thank you for all you do and for being you.